This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidoui Yuat. It's Thursday, May 28th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Americans are facing the grim reality that the coronavirus has now killed more than 100,000 people in the United States. To put that into perspective, that's a toll larger than the number of U.S. deaths in the Vietnam and Korean wars combined. The U.S. had seen some improvement in its daily death tolls, but that progress took a major step back on Wednesday when 1,400 new deaths were reported. Worldwide, more than 355,000 people have died from COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University. There are about 5.7 million confirmed global cases, with almost 30% in the U.S. Turning to Africa, a Zimbabwean government spokesman says the number of COVID-19 infections in his country has more than doubled to over 130 over the past two days. Many were Zimbabweans who had returned from South Africa and Botswana, according to a Twitter account by Nick Mangwana and reported by Reuters. The government says more than 4,000 Zimbabweans have returned to the country in the past month. Zimbabwe remains under a coronavirus lockdown. Kenya's government is taking heat over quarantine centers it launched to curb the spread of COVID-19, with witnesses saying some are dirty and expose residents to a greater risk of catching coronavirus. Sudan is reporting over 4,100 COVID-19 cases and at least 180 deaths. Meanwhile, today is World Hunger Day, and some 265 million people worldwide are expected to face acute food insecurity this year because of the coronavirus pandemic, according to a World Food Program analysis. That number is more than double the number of 130 million who are estimated to suffer food shortages last year. COVID-19 is disrupting food supply chains because many farmers and laborers cannot work or travel and transportation delays are causing shortages. These breaks in the supply chain are not only affecting the availability of food, but also its affordability. Millions who are already struggling to support themselves and their families are being devastated by economic hardship due to global virus lockdowns. As many African countries reopen, the head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention urges widespread testing as the best way to avoid a surge in new cases of coronavirus. VOA Salem Solomon spoke to the director of the Africa CDC. Dr. John Nkingisong, director of the Africa CDC, told VOA to have a reasonably accurate picture of how the disease is spreading. Africa needs about 15 million tests, or enough to test about 1% of the population. To date, only 1.8 million people have been tested continent-wide. If we do not know a pandemic, we cannot fight a pandemic. It's like we're at war. If you do not know your enemy, you can't fight the enemy. In order to bridge the testing gap, the Africa CDC has created the Partnership to Accelerate COVID Testing. The partnership will establish a platform for African countries to pull resources in order to buy diagnostic tools available on the international market. In King Song, hopes the platform will go live in about a week. To date, the Africa CDC has distributed about 2.7 million tests and has plans to distribute about 900,000 in Senegal this week. Still, in King Song said, there are many blind spots which affect the accuracy of overall numbers. Yes, certainly missing cases out there because our surveillance system are weak, our health system are weak, we are certainly missing cases there. The real question is by how much, okay, by, are we missing it by whole lot or are we missing a, a few cases here and there? So as we increase our testing ability, we'll be able to answer that question. The concern that we have is, is what we are not seeing going to harm Africa has recorded a lower caseload than other parts of the globe with about 117,000 cases of COVID-19 infection and about 3,500 deaths. However, in recent weeks, 
New cases have been increasing at a rate of about 30 percent. One headline-grabbing example took place in Ghana earlier this month when more than 500 people tested positive in one day at a fish processing factory. Now suggests that we are um, uh, on the increasing side of the, the slope. So we are not yet at the top of the slope or we are not decreasing. So I think that has to be put in context. And this implies clearly that we cannot be complacent. To combat this worrying trend, Nkin Kasong said the Africa CDC is leading an effort to recruit and train one million foot soldiers or people who can hit the streets to do contact tracing. He also stressed the need to expand health systems to meet the additional need and to protect them from being overloaded. The harm that uh, if we do not protect our uh, healthcare workers uh, th that it may have on on the on our overall ability to provide care for the, uh, the, the community is huge, okay? And uh, it, it, this includes the damage that it can cause to our HIV, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and immunization programs, yeah. So these are all things that we must, uh, the ch challenges that we face across the board. Salem Solomon, VOA News, Washington. Civilians who are bearing the brunt of militant attacks in northern Mozambique say they feel safe in the town of Pemba, but aid groups that are helping them say the coronavirus is posing challenges because of overcrowding. VOS Andre Baptista has this report narrated by Sirwan Kajo. Pemba is the capital city of Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique, where militant attacks have forced thousands of civilians to flee their homes. Yet. Pamba has also now become a safe haven for people in other parts of the rest of province who are escaping violence. According to UN statistics, more than 100,000 people have left their villages with a large number heading to Pamba. Maria Rashid arrived in Pamba in April after militants invaded her village. She says she and her small children spent two days on the road before reaching safety in Pamba. I started walking through the jungle with the children, but shots were heard in a neighboring village. We got tired, so we spent the night in the bushes. Now enjoying safe haven, these internally displaced people, nonetheless, have other essential needs such as adequate food and shelter. The charity organization Caritas is affiliated with the Catholic Church. Its officials are concerned about the growing numbers of displaced people, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. One major phenomenon we noticed during this time of social isolation is that households have multiplied in numbers. A small place with not much room now has more than 20 people. This is not an ideal situation during the coronavirus, and that worries us a lot. Due to movement restrictions and instability in April, humanitarian assistance from the World Food Program reached just 39,500 people out of a total of 95,000 displaced people in Pampa and other districts of Cabo Delgado. A large supply of aid reportedly was seized by the insurgents when they took control of a warehouse near the town of Kasinga. James Lameter, deputy director of WFP in Mozambique, told VUA that despite such losses, his organizations will continue to provide food assistance in communities in need. He said the UN is mobilizing resources to respond to the needs of displaced people amid COVID-19 and other diseases spreading in the African nation. For Andre Baptista in Cabo Delgado, Mozambique, this is Sirwan Kejo, VOA News, Washington. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently called for mental health treatment to be given to millions of people around the world who are suffering from psychological distress triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not just about those who are sick, but for all of us, the fear of what might happen if we do catch the virus. And it's especially acute for caregivers. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias has this first-hand report. Marisa and her husband Juan Carlos, both nurses, work with the sickest, most acute patients in a Washington, D.C. hospital. Those patients are put on ECMO, which is uh, bypassing their lungs, and it's pretty much their last shot. Of course, I don't want to bring any anything home with us. My oldest has asthma, and you know that puts her at greater risk. 
we in the front line, we know what's happening and we know that there's no cure. You have to change your clothes, make sure that you leave all your shoes outside, everything outside, so everything is clean so you don't bring the virus in. Fear and anxiety about getting infected with COVID-19 are not exclusive to those working on the front lines of the pandemic. The Pew Research Center reports that one third of Americans experienced high levels of psychological distress at some point during the lockdowns. Therapists have seen this surge up close. Some people will respond in a fight or flight kind of way in which they go into a hyper arousal state in which they feel anxious. And then there are people that respond in a hypo arousal state, which is more of the freeze response. And that's usually when, when people are kind of resigned and withdrawn. Awareness is, is very fundamental. These parents barely have time to look inwards. Their focus is on making their daughter's lives as normal as possible. We don't show our emotions in front of them or our fears, so I don't think they know what's happening. What is your worst fear? Dying and leaving my kids without parents. Keeping feelings bottled up, however, isn't the best approach, the experts warn. Kids are very observant and very intuitive about how their parents are doing. What usually we see is some uh, withdrawal from, from the family or mild irritability, changes in their sleep and their uh, appetite. So being able to talk about it helps them to, to uh, participate and not to assume that this is their fault. As some parts of the country begin to reopen with strict distancing guidelines, another kind of fear is haunting this small restaurant owner. I have just come out of college. Um, I have student loans I've got to take care of if this does not become a stable business, I'm going to have plenty of other issues on my hand. Sim and her parents regularly sanitize the restaurant, but wonder if the extra precautions will be enough. If your customer feels like they are uncomfortable or they are being exposed, they're not going to want to sit and dine in. People taking deliveries have dropped. The fear is who touched the food, how has it been made? It's a reasonable concern. But beyond that, if we get into doing something that would affect our daily function, that becomes obsession, compulsion, paranoia, or extreme anxiety. Therapists are offering online consultations, but with no end in sight for the pandemic, even those who affirm they are mentally strong have worries. Hopes are going down day by day. Will we get out from it? When will we get out from it? How long can we stay in business? Time will tell. Maybe it might be invisible to just close the place and walk away. The Pew survey found the highest levels of psychological distress among those with severe financial problems or who feared infection from the virus. In that context, Dr. Habipur predicts a rising demand for mental health support in the coming months. At their workplace, Maurice and her husband have access to mental health care. So far, though, she's opted to focus on the positive while handling the stress. Being able to talk to uh, colleagues in the nursing world um, who have gone through the same things and understand um, life and death on that level, but seeing patients get better, um, you know, that really helps as well. For VOA News, Veronica Valderas Iglesias, Northern Virginia. As always, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24 seven on voaafrica.com. Still to come, strategies for Africa's economic recovery from the ravages of COVID-19. We'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Millions who are already struggling to get by on the economic margins have had their lives made even harder by coronavirus lockdowns, layoffs, and loss of a chance to earn from a day's work. Here's VOA's Maria Madiello. In Buenos Aires, Rosemary Carabajal, a mother of two, is a coffee vendor by trade. Her husband is also out of work. Hopefully this pandemic will go away soon because otherwise I don't know what will happen to all the people who are independent and live day to day. Argentina has been plunged into a recession where more than a third of the country's 44 million citizens live in poverty according to official figures. Times were tough even before the pandemic. This week, Protesters gathered in the capital's Plaza de Mayo to demand the government lifts the quarantine that's been in place since mid-March. In Argentina, thousands die every year due to infectious diseases. It's regrettable, but we need to work. We need to come back to our jobs. It's our right. In Jakarta, Budi Santosa has no way to make a decent living. He lost his job as a cook, but also his other work as a taxi driver. I can't feed my children and wife by staying at home. In fact, we are taking bigger chance of being infected by the coronavirus if we go on the road. So I hope we can get some aid from the government. Santosa is one of about 2 million people who have lost work as a result of the pandemic in Indonesia. In Nairobi's Kibera section, one of the world's poorest, a 33-year-old single mother of five can relate. Judith Andeka, who lost her husband two years ago, made a living by washing clothes for less than $5 a day. That all but dried up. After the coronavirus came, life has become difficult. Even the manual labor I used to do for women has become difficult to get because jobs have been closed and now women are at home doing the jobs for themselves. The U.S. along with wealthier countries have not been spared. Hotel workers Sonia Bautista and William Gonzalez lost their jobs soon after the pandemic hit. They receive unemployment benefits, but it's still been a struggle. Our landlord was calling us, calling us, when are you going to pay, when are you going to pay? One of the biggest concerns besides uh, the, the, the money to pay rent and bills is that the fact that we are not having any health insurance. 39 million Americans have applied for unemployment benefits, sharing in the pain and economic woes felt around the world. Maria Madiello, VOA News. African Americans are being hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic's economic fallout. The unemployment rate for black Americans is nearly 17% compared to 14.5% for white Americans. Tapping into federal financial help hasn't been easy either for these groups. VOA's Michelle Quinn reports. Terrence Can hasn't worked at his Oakland barber shop since mid-March when California's shelter-in-place order went into effect. He hasn't applied for federal help as his income dried up. Actually, I called the bank, but they said that they were not um, accepting any more applications. You know what I'm saying? So um, you don't really know exactly which way to go being a small business because it's not much information out there available to you. Can is fortunate. He has a little savings, and his wife works at a grocery store. But the fact that Can hasn't tapped into any federal help is common among African Americans, say observers. Black people in the U.S. have been among the hardest hit economically in the crisis. Unemployment is higher for black Americans than white ones. Many black business owners do not have relationships with banks or the financial cushion needed to weather hard times, they say. Thank God I had a little savings. You know, other than that, my savings is doing the win, but, you know, who can I really complain to? Derek Johnson, owner of the Home of Chicken and Waffles restaurant in Oakland, was able to get some federal assistance, but he worries about his employees. A large number of individuals in the communities in which I employ from 
like I said, don't have internet, don't have access to internet. So how do they apply for unemployment? How do they even know about any of these, you know, programs that are going on? Beyond financial help, tapping into networks that can help black business owners get back into business is also a struggle, says Carolyn Johnson, executive director of the East Oakland Black Cultural Zone. Again, it goes back to network. A lot of businesses, if you have the right relationships, and you can call someone and say, can you make sure when you get a truck of gloves or whatever, you hook me up, that helps. But again, if we're not networked and in those circles and people don't think, by giving your friend who's a business owner that box, who are you forgetting? Restaurant owner Johnson says he helped his employees apply for unemployment, and he and other black business owners call each other and give advice. It's the time to, to not really panic, relax, take a deep breath, and call all of your creditors, call all of your, whoever you have to pay bills with, and let them know, look, I can't do it. For Can, the barber, it is touch and go. You know, thank God that I am able to sustain for a little while, but, you know, I just don't know how long, but we'll see how it goes. You know, I just keep praying. I keep, um, you know, just try to keep a positive attitude. <laughs> Michelle Quinn, VOA News, Oakland, California. In our business report, COVID-19 is first and foremost a global public health crisis, but it's also having significant economic effects on countries worldwide. Measures needed to contain the virus, including confinement, closure of shops, travel bans, and bans on various activities, are taking their toll on businesses and the informal sector. Africa 54's Lino Mudu spoke with Aaron Betru, Managing Director of the Center for the Financial Markets at the Milken Institute. He elaborates on some steps to economic recovery in Africa. For the past few months, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been wrecking havoc around the world. What are your thoughts on uh, what uh, we are witnessing with this particular health crisis? There's two sides to this that everybody is well aware of. On one side, it's the health-related issues, and then on the other side, the twin economic-related issues that we're dealing with, not just for things of today, but things that we're going to have to be dealing with in terms of a recovery uh, across the board. And for the continent in particular, uh, there's going to be a number of issues. Very often, there is a tendency to turn to the international community uh, when uh, there is such crisis, uh, whether it's in Africa or other parts of the world. But in this, in this case, we see that the entire world is affected. So what can be done? On the immediate side, on the, uh, we have to deal with the debt crisis. And I think there's a longstanding precedence for um, a, a moratorium on these or just refinancing a lot of the debt packages. Otherwise, we're going to be heading towards a default across the continent. And as we then look in the future, how do we deal with this? The old way of economic development, where essentially developing economies think about uh, leveraging globalization, a pre uh, labor arbitrage, low-cost goods being manufactured on the continent to be sold internationally, that's not going to be the factor. I think you're going to find a lot of developed countries saying, we need to produce the goods in those countries. And I think when we look at these domestic markets, there's some expertise that perhaps we're not recognizing. And I'm, I'm pointing towards the international aid architecture, the $150 billion of OED overseas development assistance that's principally executed by international development organizations. And so we took it upon ourselves at the Milken Institute to do a little bit of this research in partnership with UBS Optimus Foundation. We looked at 500 uh, global INGOs that are working with their donors to do a range of health uh, capacity building and delivery of commodities. And, and what, what were some of the take? findings? Well, we, what we identified was you should be looking at these entities from a couple of different pillars. On one side, there's a relationship that these organizations have with their donors. Their donors sometimes actually prevent their capabilities from really handing off into a, a, a commercial sustainable enterprise. So I think there's a change that needs to happen from the donor to the recipient organization. That's one thing that we identified. The second thing we identified was, well, how much capital uh, and what type of capital are they using? Is this a place 
for impact investors to partner with INGOs to build social enterprises. Now the issue is we need to make sure that we advance growth potential over and above the risk potential because of how slow the economies have gotten. And so looking at Basel regulations to allow capital to flow in to spur these type of activities, that's in the control of not just the Basel Committee in Switzerland, but also in the country's central banks to make sure that recovery happens appropriately. So there are some projections that uh, Africa's GDP uh, could be reduced by 3 to 8% this year because of the COVID-19 crisis. What, what do you make of it? And if you were to kind of summarize it, what kind of strategies can be put in place to make sure that resilient economies are built to be able to withstand such crises uh, in the future? Uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I think the estimates are probably a little too early. We are not exactly sure how much uh, it's going to really dip down. There, the, I've seen ranges as north of 10, 15 percent uh, across the board. So, uh, with that being said, the the strategy to come back, I think it's rooted in a couple of pillars. On one end, we actually realize that the bedrock of being able to uh, build back better, if you will, is going to be an infrastructure strategy that making sure that the foundation, there are a lot of infrastructure gaps throughout the continent, and to make local, regional, and international markets work more effectively. The second thing we probably need to realize is there is going to be effectively um, a certain number of industries that countries need to make sure that they have the ability to, to have uh, in-country um, supply chains but also on a regional basis as well. And I'm talking purely on the medical devices and pharmaceutical front. And then the third one is recognizing that vulnerable populations are the ones that are always hit, always hit. And so how do we have an inclusive economy such that people can be a part of their own resilience going forward? And that means uh, thinking a little bit more holistically about the inequality that is pervasive throughout the continent in various different countries, that we bring individuals into the economy, more women into the economy, more youth into the economy, and being able to actually have uh, 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 the bottom of the pyramid, if you will, the strongest part of the, of the economy. Aaron Bithu, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Lenore. That was Africa 54's Lino Mudu speaking with Aaron Betro, Managing Director of the Center for Financial Markets at the Milken Institute. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching.